Greetings, I'm Demonac, and this is something I have not done a whole lot. It's a little bit of D&D &D by email. In the time roughly between Tales from My D&D &D Campaign episodes 22 and 23, we couldn't play for a week, but I ended up doing a little bit of a play by email segment with Zaheer's player, and since the exchange is perfectly preserved in email, I thought I'd read both parts for you here, virtually word for word. I apologize in advance if I do a bad job on the voices, but I'm probably not editing this one. So, starting with Zaheer. So I don't think Zaheer would be too interested, or at least he would realize that he couldn't have any influence over what was going on in the meeting, so he probably wouldn't be hanging out at the castle while that was going on. I think his main and long-term goal right now is to try and find out the most possible information about that cleric of Anku who he heard has been surviving in the Shadowfell. I can't imagine there would be much or any info here in the capital, but Maya on the coast might have something. Would I be able to use one of my four available level 1 minions from leadership as a skeletal messenger raven? If so, I'd like to have him go to Maya's lighthouse with a request for any info. If I end up needing to go there to to go do it myself, that can either be handled in the week that I will be out of town IRL, or whenever it makes sense, I guess. While the Raven is going, Zaheer would probably like to go around, go to look around town and get a feel for things. I'm assuming the town beneath Castle is fairly large. Correct me if I'm wrong. Either looking into some of the weirder shops or darker places of it to try and pick up any signs of necromantic or dark cults, which could be a lead to anything regarding the Dark Ancients, or might be a lead for all the undead that rose up in that town on my first session. I'm also looking forward to also looking forward to Mahar's hat falling off or something and having to play that out. I just really didn't want it to happen in the throne room for obvious reasons. Well, Messenger Raven sounds cool, why not? So you send that off to Maya's lighthouse over in the province of Land's End, hoping to learn more about the mysterious half-elf who wanders the Shadowfell, or certainly used to. Normally that would be about three weeks round trip for the bird, it's about 300 miles away, but the unsleeping, inexhaustible, skeletal raven is about three times as fast for stuff like this, and actually kind of crazy that way, because by flying 24 hours a day instead of 8, it will be back in about one week. I should note that before you leave the palace, a courtier who is going around informs you that anyone who is at the court today for Chrysanthemum's message from the Duke about the KT offer is forbidden by the King to speak about the offer to anyone who was not present to hear about it. The secret is to be kept until you hear otherwise, probably when he makes a decision. <coughs> Anyhow, Castle, the city, is indeed pretty large, so you were able to find at least one creepy and or occult shop for sure. I'll get you more details in a few days, but let me know your gather information bonus, probably just your charisma modifier, and your knowledge religion bonus, and I'll roll to see if you find anything else. I'm sure your religion skill is way higher, but it's not as well suited to the task, so we'll see. Alright, Zaheer has a Gather Info bonus of 2 and Knowledge Religion bonus of 5, while Mahar has Gather Info of minus 1 and Knowledge Religion of 8. Okay, the following assumes a lot of actions on your part, because otherwise this would take a thousand emails for relatively little decision making. And if anything seems wrong, or if there are any specific measures or skills you want to use, feel free to jump in at any point. This would all be happening while presumably Draven, maybe some of the others, are in the closed session to discuss the Kuatoa peace offer. His appointment for kudos, etc., which includes you too, is now set for tomorrow morning. Although Mahar does pretty well at avoiding unwanted notice or human contact, even when walking through crowded streets, he's very aware of his personal space and body positioning, and very agile. But he doesn't do as great a job chatting up the locals. On this day, he actually gives up helping in on, with that aspect, it, at least for today. Because everyone he talks to seems to get a very distinct sense that something is wrong, and the conversations were all brief and suspicious. Zaheer doesn't have any particular trouble in relating to people, but you don't have any luck finding useful leads from them either. 
Over the course of the day, you are pretty sure you saw several odd charms that would indicate unorthodox religions, most of them in the hands of lower class Verandi people. Obviously, you saw tons of charms and holy symbols of major gods and religions, like Larthal, Sirius, and to a lesser degree, Kord, slash Marduk, Dialia, and Infernus, who is not as suspicious as it sounds. I looked it up, and apparently humans use that name for Moradin slash Itaru, the same name that the orcs use. But it's the non-standard ones, non-standard charms, that jump out at you, based on your and Mahar's knowledge. You recognize a couple charms devoted to Raos, the demigod who took responsibility for the sun after Palor was destroyed, and a fair number of unidentified ones, which usually means the worship of some local spirit, like a river or tree or stone or animal spirit. There is one in particular that came up several times, but you usually lost sight of the charm, and often the people wearing them, as soon as you spotted or thought you spotted them. Since this was mostly among people who you would tend to racially profile as refugees, or as coming from a Verandi refugee background, based on appearance, clothing styles, and apparent lack of wealth, the two of you naturally gravitated towards the refugee camp sort of district. The charms are mainly in the form of a rat or mouse skull or rib cage, painted gray or black, with a variety of other symbols or markings. Uh, out of character... That description sounds pretty blatantly evil or suspicious, but on its own, it isn't really abnormal at all for trinkets of minor religions or the worship of individual spirits of any alignment. Nevertheless, after a few hours of looking and getting nowhere, and a number of hushed discussions with Mahar, you are pretty sure that these charms are for some unsavory religion, and even though your companion changed his illusory disguise to fit in better with the refugees, you've stopped even catching glimpses of these things. Whoever these people are, they seem to have become aware that you, or at least that someone, are out searching for them. So you start heading back, but you make a detour to an occult shop that Mahar noticed earlier. The door is often out... The door is on an alleyway that comes off a secondary street, by which I mean not a main thoroughfare, but still a fairly well-traveled one. The little sign hanging above the door just, say, just calls it Moda's Wares, but it bears the symbol of Ayun. Very few people worship Ayun, as she is one of the least interventionist deities, but she is a god of knowledge, and her followers are known as staunch enemies of the undead, whose origins, like the Shadowfell itself, are tied to Ayun's great enemy, Vecna. <coughs> the owner may know something about the skull charms. The undead we and the others routed from good place, or the dark ancient. Or he may be as useless as this day has been. So, you may have tons of suggestions for what you would have done, or what you should do now. To that I add the obvious questions... Do you go into Moda's little back alley shop, and if so, do you bring Mahar, or leave him outside the door, or even way back at the street? What kind of relations, if any, have there been between the followers of Ayun and Priest of Anku in the past? If things have been okay and they understand the differences, then I'll bring Mahar. If we've had hostile or not really any previous encounters in the past, then I'll keep him by the door. There's no way I'm leaving him back at the street. Um, it's one of those weird situations where your demigod isn't that commonly worshipped, and Ayun, despite her and Vecna probably being the most powerful gods, has very few devoted followers. She gets a lot of incidental worship by scholars and wizards, but you've never even heard of a person being a priest of Ayun. They probably exist, but you you don't know of any individual ones, never even heard of one. So, in this particular case, your character doesn't know any more than what I wrote above. Followers of Ayun are seekers of knowledge, almost always either for good or for its own sake. And if they are the rare true followers, not just some guy who likes books, they don't like undead. All right, I'll, I'll tell Mahara to stay by the door, but to be on his toes and ready to come in if the need arises. So I enter the store and take a look around. <clears throat> Mahar grumbles. As you wish. 
I could just take off the hat and play dead if you like. Which is odd, because you're sure he didn't want to come in any more than he wanted to be left outside. For a guy who doesn't talk much, sometimes you'd swear that complaining was another of those martial arts he studied when he was alive. Anyway, opening the door triggers a very sad little ding, as though there were supposed to be several bells or charms, but all but one of them are broken. The inside of Moda's wares is not much to look at. Most of it has been recently dusted, but there are thick accumulations in several corners and up high, as though it were being cared for by somebody lazy or absent-minded or... or short. A boy, probably twelve years old, steps out from a side room to see what's up. Hello, sir. You want to buy some charms? I can tell you about most of them, but if you want to look at the weird ones or the books, I can call Moda down for you. She slaps me if I try to read the books. Says I'll get the pages all sticky and no one will buy them. His finger was creeping up towards his nose, but as though that were totally unconscious and against his will, he sees it and whips his hand behind his back. So apart from learning from the pronouns that Moda is a female, the name seemed pretty unisex to you, you see that the main room of the store is full of shelves which look sort of like china cabinets, but most of them without glass. Some are lined with books, but the majority are filled with religious charms of all denominations on crude wooden display stands. A quick scan of the shelves leaves you fairly certain that none of them are that evilish charm you had been seeing around town, at least none of the ones on display. In fact, nothing on display pertains to any major evil deity or any of the evil spirits that you know of. You also don't see any charms relating to Anku, or Ayun for that matter. Standing there for a brief moment, looking around and deciding what to say or do, you feel a brief hint of nausea, though it subsides into a dull headache. If you hesitate, the boy looks to his left and steps over to straighten something in order to avoid awkwardly staring at you for too long. Okay. I try to ignore the sudden headache, while and while looking over the charms, I casually say, if it isn't too much trouble, I would like to have a look at the more exotic charms you mentioned. I am also interested in meeting Moda. Oh, sorry, I that was out of character. I'm also interested in meeting Moda to see if she's actually a follower of Ayun or not. Okay. The boy makes good on his offer to call Moda down in the least subtle manner imaginable. Grandma, there's a customer. You hear some bumping around upstairs and a couple drawers opening and closing, then feet shuffling down a staircase, which must be just out of view through the doorway where the boy came from. The woman who steps into view is not a hag. She must be about 50 or 60 years old, but if so, she's looking about as good as you can hope for at that age. Her wrinkles have not yet consumed her face, and she walks with only a hint of slowness. Then she attacks you with a throwing star. Martin, duck for cover! You and your hordes of undead won't claim us today, necromancer! From across the room, she dings you in the chest with a light shuriken, which has a strip of ruined paper hanging from it. You were flat-footed and possibly suffering a mild aneurysm, or at least a double-take, at the odd turn of events, but the weapon just kind of sticks into your armor's chest piece, causing no damage. Nothing really happens at all. You don't think the woman is combat-trained, or if she ever was, she's mostly lost it, and you're not even sure that the throwing star or the paper attached to it are actually magical. Her hands are shaking now. Morton, the boy, is half-acidly ducking with no cover, in plain sight, and sounds pretty disturbed. Grandma, what the hell are you doing? Sorry, he said heck. Morton has been trained not to swear. Um, if you want to make any kind of skill check, just tell me what your bonus is and I'll roll it for you. I should have mentioned that you both rolled pretty mediocre on the gather info, but rolled very high on the religion check. Also, I'm probably going to bed soon. All right, uh, with a diplomacy bonus of four, I put my hands up, palms facing her, showing I have nothing in them. I wish you no harm, and I assure you I do not have any hordes of undead to claim with. I came in search of answers, uh, not a fight. 
As I finish saying this, I try to pull the shuriken from my chest, hoping it doesn't explode. Uh, no explosion. You easily pull the multi-pointed metal object from your queer ass. It was barely deep enough to stick there without falling out. Moda points a shaky but accusing finger. You should be held and weakened. I've consecrated this ground. Who are you, and why do you smell like an open grave? Uh, it should be noted that despite your tomb-tainted soul feet, you certainly do not smell any different, at least within the human sensory range. Um, maybe dogs can tell. I'm, I'll also say that you are not suffering any statistical penalty from the headache. The old woman is wearing a modest, faded blue dress. She isn't armored and does not appear armed with anything else, though shuriken are kind of the definition of concealable. As I've said, I did not come here for conflict, and the reason I'm not held or affected by this holy ground is most likely due to being completely human. As for the smell you speak of, I am a priest of Enku, the shepherds for the dead. We are responsible for ensuring the proper order of life and death are respected, and to help the souls that are lost between our world and the next to move on. I came to your store to ask about a charm I have been seeing around town. Anku, Anku. Her, her pose loses that aggressive edge as she tries to remember all that she knows about Anku, her raised hand making idle motions, which you are fairly certain are not somatic components, though you watch very carefully in case she's just playing absent-minded. The Lantern of the Lost then you would be both alive and dead, at least a little. My wards in Ofuda were meant for those who are neither. She notices her raised hand and lowers it to her side. Morton's like, Can I stop ducking now? Yes, it's fine. If he was really bad, my barrier should have woken me, from, woken me up from my nap, instead of just messing with my dreams. When you did wake me, I feared it might have been something so powerful and evil as to overwhelm my little wards, but I think he really only half-triggered it. It takes her a moment to realize she should add, I'm sorry about the, uh, er, thingy. She waggles a finger at the throwing star in your hand and the paper strip hanging from it. No harm done, right? Now, what is this charm like? Can you describe it? Or better yet... She opens a small door on one of the cabinets and pulls out some small paper scraps. Can you draw it for me? Morton, fetch a quill and inkwell. I'm Moda, by the way. I don't suppose you have any art or calligraphy type skills, but you should be able to manage even without. Based on your excellent knowledge religion check earlier, you ought to remember the details that most stood out to you and get those across at the very least. All right. I crack a small smile. No, uh, no harm done. I'm sure you have heard of my order. Oh, uh, sorry. I'm glad you have heard of my order. I walk over and pass her the shuriken and grab the paper and quill from Morton. Thank you. It uh, looked like... Uh, insert description of charm. While attempting to draw the charm I had seen... I have never come across this charm or symbol during my studies, so... I believe it may be of local origin. Not much of an artist. Are these markings accurate? You nod yes, since that's the most distinguishing part and the part you focused on. Hmm. I need a book. Which one? I can help find it. Thanks, Sonny, but it's not down here. Go put on some tea. The nice-smelling one or the gross one? The bitter one. Gross, but he obediently goes off to start that to start on that. Uh, come upstairs with me. I don't sell the books with dangerous things in them. It's a fine line because Ayun teaches us that knowledge is good and to share it benefits all, but spreading some ideas just gives for stupid and selfish people an outlet they don't really need. She leads you around the corner and up the creaky wooden spiral stair to a second-floor hall, unlocks the door at the end, and lights a couple candles in a room full of shelves. 
Clearly Morton doesn't come in here because it hasn't been dusted in months. She seems to know exactly which book she wants, though. You can see a few that have been used recent-ish, judging by the dust fingerprints, and this is not one of those. This book is written in Draconic, and you don't get a good view of the title, though in the shadowy illumination you note other books with titles in Common, Dwarven, Elven, Draconic, at least two other languages. Some of them must be centuries old. Ah, here we are. I remembered that one. It's a rune used by Cornello. But these other bits are new. This one... She accidentally smudges it on your drawing with her finger, trying to point it out. Is the sign of a region a couple weeks due west of here, right around... She snaps out of her research mode and looks you in the eyes, very seriously. Is this about that thing that happened in Woodbridge? Why, oh why, are greedy fools so easily seduced by things that any child could see for what they really are? Uh, out of character, Woodbridge was the town filled with undead, right? I'm basing what I'm about to say on that. If it isn't, I'll fix it. Also, do I know anything about Cornello? Are the events that happened in Woodbridge... And are the, the events that happened in Woodbridge common knowledge? Uh, there have been many dark happenings in the world recently. This symbol could be involved in any one of them. Also, how is it that you know of what happened in Woodbridge? I didn't think that word had spread. Uh, yes, that's the one. Word of the orcs you fought barely reached town before you, and few, if any, details are known here. The encounter in Woodbridge, the barony, and uh, Good Place, the town, has a good we has had a good week to get here before you guys, though. You haven't heard anything about any Cornello. You don't even know if she means a person, a place, or an organization. There's been plenty of word that something bad went on in that area, but I haven't heard anything specific that wasn't obviously just rumors. Though now that I think of it, a couple of the rumors mentioned zombies or ghosts which sounds a whole lot more likely if it has to do with you, and more so if these charms are going around. Unfortunately, it seems that uh, more often than not, things had to do with me lately. Back on the topic at hand, though, these charms and this Cornello you speak of, what do you know of them and their connection to the events at Woodbridge? I'm surprised you don't know of him. Cornello is one of the vampire kings who live in the Shadowfell. I think his home is near North Cove. That's a county on the north coast of Vistria. But I'd have to research a bit to be sure. Either way, Woodbridge, or the corresponding place in the Dark Lands, is probably within his territory. He and the other self-proclaimed vampire kings are immortal because of the undead blood-drinking stuff. But that's not why they're dangerous. They're dangerous because they have ways of enslaving the spirits in their territories, and from all that they and from that they gain all kinds of powers. Now they don't usually pose a direct threat to us. They either can't come to our world or won't for whatever reason. Maybe it's because the ancients spanked them so hard last time they tried. Who knows? But they feud with each other over control of different spirits and the land that happens to be under them, using armies of ungodly walking dead and maybe other monstrosities. She pauses and recalls what you actually asked. But the, the charms, yes. You see, some spirits don't have any power that is useful to a vampire like Cornello. But they bind them anyway, because sometimes they still have things that mortals want and so they can be used to tempt and bargain with anyone on this side that they can get in touch with. There's always somebody who can be tempted by the lure of wealth or power or immortality, though from everything I've heard, they don't really like to make new vampires. It causes them nothing but trouble, usually. That doesn't mean they can't promise it, though. That charm you drew me is a sign of someone sick, desperate, stupid, or just plain evil enough that they're trying to make deals or gain favors with Cornello, or one of his vassals. Someone almost certainly up to no good, though the misdeeds might not even be directed against the people of this land. 
Damned if I know how they even get in touch with the Shadowfell, though. Plus, I'm no expert on the Vampire Kings, and I have nothing remotely reasoned about their shifting borders, but I can pretty much guarantee that Cornello doesn't control this area. Hmm. Then it is even more concerning than I thought. It seems there is a rather large number of these charms circulating in the city. Although, is it common for a vampire king to have charms outside of his area of control? That I don't know. I, I wouldn't think so, especially since we're talking about this plane, and they only really control land on the other side. But there's no way to be sure, considering that usually the minions, or accomplices, or whatever you want to call them, should be using charms mainly just to identify one another. I can't imagine how one could realistically study such things. I'd buy that book. There isn't all that much more I can tell you about the Vampire Kings, save that another of them, called Swain, is based right around here, or rather, the same spot as the Citadel. That's one thing you'll find about the other plains. If there's a mountain, or a lake, or even a fortress or other large building in our world, there's a very good chance you'll find something similar, or at least similar size and materials at the same place. <coughs> But you mentioned that you had some contact with whatever happened in Woodbridge. What did go on there? What got you looking into the Vampire Kings? Can I try to roll a sense motive? With just wisdom, I have a bonus of four. If she seems just legitimately curious, I say, I'm not sure what you have heard, but there was what seemed to be an undead invasion from the Shadowfell into our world. A minor portal appeared between our two planes, and I have every intention of figuring out who may have opened it, whether Vampire King or otherwise. If she seems more devious, then I'll just say, I'm not sure what you have heard, but there was a small number of undead there, most likely link nothing linked to the Vampire Kings, but I've decided to take a look into it. Uh, the impression you get is that she's the type of person who is curious about damp near anything, but maybe a little more curious about possible undead dangers, maybe even a little paranoid about them. So the first answer seems to make more sense. Do you mean just a short-term portal that lets through a handful of people, or an honest-to-goodness stable portal? Because the latter would take a huge amount of power, and for the vampires that usually means... Her lip curls in disgust. Mass human sacrifice. I don't really know much about real magic. It, it took me years to ward up this place using tricks and rituals from old books, but I read in a couple places that to force open a portal from here to the Shadowfell, you have to start on this side. That would explain why Cornello would be putting so much effort into establishing followers in our world, but it doesn't make sense around here. From their point of view, we're a little more than a resource, and opening up a portal in his rival's land would just be giving away a lot of power. There must be something else they are up to. You hear Morton's voice uh, from out in the upstairs hall. Since you're in the special book room, I'm just going to leave the tea out here. Unless I can come in... No. Okay. You hear the faint clatter of him setting down a tray of tea out there. Whatever they're doing must be really big if they're putting this much effort into going, getting it going. A full-on war? Or some sort of mass spell requiring the sacrifices? Or maybe he's turning people to make an army. I must message the temples at once. This can't be allowed to be repeated. Uh, that may be jumping to conclusions. I hope it is. But if you have allies who could start looking more deeply into it, or using divinations on the subject, it's something you should certainly look into. I, unfortunately, am an old woman. I don't have a lot of useful friends left these days. and Those who are still out there were an elf and an eladrin. 
The latter left the country months ago because of his pe his people's own problems, and the elf is le leaving soon as well. Though he's already delayed the journey a few times, I may still be able to reach him if I can get a message to New Vanover. I'm not sure if it's a good idea for this to start traveling. Maybe tell him there's something important, but not too many details. Not just yet. And Mori's like, uh, perhaps. Anyhow, unless there's anything else you can think of to ask her, that's probably it for the scene. Uh, you can bring, you can drink bitter tea. Sounds good. I'll have some bitter and take my departure. So that was that was it for the exchange there. I thought that was fun. Probably like to do some more stuff like that, but it usually didn't work in. Draven did a little tiny bit of the play by email. His part of his part of his household staff, a Porter, did some talking with uh, an aide to the Chancellor, Lord Unthor, and managed to get Draven in on the secret meeting that they held after Chrysanthemum's revelations in the castle. But we did, we didn't get a lot of emails back and forth. It wasn't anything like this. Anyway, I guess the last thing I should mention is just the voice that I do for Zaheer. I don't really remember what his in character voice was. If it was different than his normal voice, and I mainly needed to find a voice that <laughs> that would stand out from the others, and I just sort of took this speech pattern. It, a little different. So that's mostly the, the, the Zaheer voice isn't really representative. Then again, neither is the Angel voice for that matter, since Angel's actual player doesn't try and do a small female gnome voice. He's got a relatively deep voice of his own. Anyhow, I hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time on Tales from My D&D &D Campaign. If you enjoyed this, please click the like button, or on your touchscreen, please lick the like button. Warning, licking the touchscreen is not recommended.